So I'm honored tonight to introduce um, our banquet speaker this year, is Dr. Lee Ward. Lee is from SSEC Sims at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I was going to say what those acronyms are in case anybody cared or that they don't really forget in the process. Um, so Lee got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in 1997. Um, after that, he spent um, 12 years, I think, at Central Michigan University as a uh, professor of meteorology there before returning to the University of Wisconsin just a few years ago. Um, if you haven't ever seen any of Lee's stuff on the internet or at other conferences, you're in for a treat tonight. Um, as Lee will admit, I think he's a little bit of a computer nerd or expert. Might be a higher way to say that. So he, he deals with the kind of modeling that some of the rest of us who do modeling probably lie awake dreaming at night, kind of wishing we got to do this. So it's really spectacular visualizations, and we, you're going to learn a lot tonight um, of the things that he is discovering from these numerical simulations that may turn um, on your head, turn on their head ideas that you have about how we get tornadoes. So again, um, I know Lee spoke at the AMS Severe Local Storms Conference in Vermont in October. I believe he was one of the first days, but I can tell you that pretty much his presentation was what everybody talked about for the entire rest of the week at the conference. It's really cool stuff. So without further ado, uh, let's give the uh, warm welcome to the conference. All right. And I think I've got the technology figured out. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate being invited to this conference. This is my second, the second time I've come here. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy my talk. It's about uh, high-resolution supercell modeling, and um, we'll just let her rip, assuming everything works here. Do -do -do. Okay, so the problem. We should state our problem first. Whoops, the problem is I turned, didn't turn this thing on yet. So you're seeing my talk too fast. All right, here we go. Let's try that again. All right. Okay, so yeah, I'll, this is another thing. All my talks are videos, so you see slides like this. This is just a video. I'm pausing a video. Isn't that amazing? I should write a book about this, but nobody else should do this. This is crazy. Okay, so the problem, it really is. I don't know, I don't know why I do this. It works. Well, I could tell stories, but I want to keep this talk under like an hour or so. Um, so supercells, as we know, are the prolific producers of the most damaging tornadoes. This is, this is something everyone in this room knows. The vast majority of supercells do not produce these top-end tornadoes. And I'm um, looking forward to Matt Parker's talk tomorrow on uh, what determines you know, he, what, uh, whether supercells produce tornadoes or not, because we're all kind of looking at this in the same, the same problem. Um, the pre-storm environmental conditions are a great indicator for you know, what kind of convective mode we could expect. We might get isolated supercells, we might get a, a line echo wave pattern, we might get an MCS. Um, but can you extract enough data from the environment before the storm forms and then get a forecast that gives you the, pr the proper answer that you know, the tornado goes here, goes there? That's a tough order. Um, and actually it's something that we're trying to do. Our understanding of processes within supercells is really lacking. Uh, what's going on inside of supercells regarding tornadoes? The difficult problem, we've got lots of measurements of radar, what's going on in supercells that are tornadic. But um, I really think, and again, I'm coming at this from the perspective of modeling. You know, I'm the modeler guy, so my head is in the model a lot, and I realize the real atmosphere is out there, and I pay a lot of attention to it. But I have to say that I think our understanding is sorely lacking. Uh, we have some long-standing conceptual models that are, are great, um, but I think they need revising. There is a lack of knowledge regarding the factors involved in long-track maintenance or long-track tornadoes during the maintenance phase. We talk so much about tornado genesis, right? We have a tornado. Now what? What's going to keep that thing going? That's another problem. We need to figure that out. Um, so questions, questions. Can we, the scientific community, in a deterministic manner, predict a tornado's path and strength before the storm that spawns it forms. Can we do that? I took some text from the Weather Act of 2017 that has actually been passed. Congress actually did pass some things. Um, this, and, and Louis Uccellini talks about this and how he's going to be using this initiative to improve the weather service, et cetera. Another UW grad, by the way. Um, the Weather Act of 2017 states, and I'll skip some of that language, but we are supposed to be able to predict tornadoes beyond one hour in advance. 
Okay? Um, now I think you can all go, <laughs> yeah, sure, no problem. Um, you know, give me a few million dollars, a supercomputer, 10 grad students in five years, I might be able to get you pretty close, but that's a tough, tough problem. But we are being charged to do this. Um, other questions, are the most important factors determining a top end tornado's behavior in the atmosphere found in the pre-storm environment? Or is there some internal variability in supercells that we're never gonna be able to overcome? And that's a real, we don't have an answer to that. Uh, we all know about chaos. We all know about the sensitivity of factors and models, uh, initial conditions, et cetera. Um, but it may turn out that uh, this is a real issue. So um, let me get this down a little, get a little too loud. So, and finally, are there microscale flow features that perhaps like some things we've discovered in our, in our simulations that are common to supercells that only produce the most devastating tornadoes. Again, I'm trying to think in terms of operations, you know, I mean, ultimately that's why we do this stuff, so we can forecast this stuff, so we can get people out of the way or at least alert them. Um, and maybe, maybe there is, at least there's a possibility that we may be able to use radar to figure some of this stuff out. So the three pinnacles of meteorology observations, theory, and models. Um, this is how we're gonna answer the question. It's not gonna be all this. Um, a lot of it's that, and a lot of it's that, and that's one of the things I love about meteorology, because you got all three parts of it. Um, I am very interested in things like astrophysics and things like that, but there's no way I'm ever gonna be able to go to a black hole. So <laughs> I can go to a storm, a storm can come to me, I can see it, I can taste it, smell it, touch it, get blown over by it. That's actually kind of cool about the weather, in my opinion. But uh, oftentimes, you don't want to get too close, but observations, and a little Rich Rotuno action over here on the right. All right, so limitations of our current approaches, I can, you know, we all know radar can only see what it sees, and it, you know, I'm not gonna go into great details, but it can't remotely detect thermodynamic quantities. It'd be nice if it could. Um, in situ approaches often miss the target, or it's just difficult to measure stuff where stuff needs being measured. Um, you know, we can fly UAVs into supercells, we can deploy probes, uh, we can put stick nets, we can do radars, but it's still really difficult. And the theory, of course, is only as good as the assumptions that are built into the equations, and models are only as good as the theory behind them, require parameterizations. I know I could go on about how crappy models are, but they're also pretty cool. Um, my approach uh, is sort of computer first, model first. Take the computer, do whatever you can with it to get the result you want. I am come at this from the perspective of a new supercomputer has been built, how can I exploit that thing to answer some interesting weather questions? So I come at this from a sort of a skewed perspective from maybe most meteorologists. I really am thinking technology, how can I get this model to exploit this hardware so that I can get my real goal is to figure out how the hell tornadoes work. Um, what kind of grid spacing are we gonna need? I'm thinking single digits, one to I'll say five meters or so, uh, isotropic preferably, at least in the vicinity of a tornado, that's, we're gonna get to the point where we can do this. I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about some more of the technological things coming down the pipe. But anyway, I would say if you're standing here looking at this and you're like, gee, do I wanna do something like him? Know that most of what you do is not weather related. At least th there's a lot of uh, stuff you have to do first. I spent most of my time since 2010 uh, fighting with computers and trying to figure out how to handle you know, petabytes of data and how to get that petabytes down to terabytes. Um, because it's, you know, it's, it's a tough problem. It's not for everyone, but thankfully there's some of us weirdos who do this. I think it's important. Um, other weirdos who have done things like this before, modelers, uh, you know the stuff in the top left, that's Bob Wilhelmson's work, his pioneering work. It took a team of like three, you know, two scientists uh, and, and a visualization person like a year to get this, this uh, Grammy nominated uh, video sequence. Uh, I think it's called Study of a Severe su uh, Supercell, I can't remember. But you know, he started it all. Uh, he did work with Bruce Lee, who works very closely with Kathy Finley. Um, he did a three paper sequence from his PhD work on non-supercell tornadoes, pretty much wrote the book on it. Um, there's some nice graphics there. We have Ming Shui's work at the University of Oklahoma with the ARPS model. He commandeered the Pittsburgh Computing Center for like, I don't know, they gave him like a month of time in the whole machine and he got an EF5 out of the Dell City, the oft simulated Dell City storm. Uh, similar work with ARPS is done by Noda and Nino in 2005. Um, our work uh, was in 2016, 2017, and there's efforts in China now, Yao et al. This is, I think, a 10 meter simulation or 15 meter simulation from a supercell in China. So uh, you gotta pay attention to non-AMS journals, by the way. <laughs> 
There's a lot of stuff out there that's go, that doesn't make it into the AMS journals, and that was one of those papers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. Um, some of you are old enough to maybe remember the days back when we didn't have, uh, you know, the computing capacity was much less than it is. You go back to the 60s, you get the CDC, controlled data. Uh, the 6600 had 982 screaming kilobytes of memory, ran at an amazing three megaflops. It weighed like 700 tons, I don't know. Um, these were the computers that the first, oh gosh, I'm glad I was born later because you know, you're running 2D models at coarse resolution and feeding punch cards, and oh, it's just an ugly situation. Um, the 70s and 80s, I just put Cray, because Cray kind of dominated the supercomputing field for quite a while. Uh, Cray came out with its uh, vector processor, where you could like do four mathematical calculations at the same time. I mean, that speeds things up quite a bit. Um, Cray is a set up, Seymour Cray was actually worked for CDC. He formed his own company in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. What is Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin known for? Thank you. That's me and Jake Leinenkugel in 1986. I'm not kidding. I actually, so my, my, my stepfather grew up, he went to school at Iowa State, I actually got his PhD in chemistry. Um, he has family up in like Hudson, New Richmond area. And one day, one Sunday, we went to the visitor center. The, 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 the tours were closed. I've been hearing these commercials on the radio for, I'm Jake Leinenkugel, and blah, 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 blah. I thought he was just a marketing tool. So I joke with the lady behind the desk. I bought a shirt, as you can see, and I said, hey, is Jake around? Ha, ha, ha. She says, oh, yeah, he's in the back room doing stuff you want me to come out. So I was the coolest dude on my dorm floor, man, after I came out with that picture. Anyway, so, so that's, that's a much younger Lee Orff and a much younger Jake Leinenkugel. Um, he's a real guy. So anyway. Uh, the 80s, we started to get into multiprocessor shared memory machines. Uh, the connection machine, the work that Bruce Lee did, was, was uh, on that very interesting uh, architecture, which was short-lived, but really pretty cool. Um, I'm skipping ahead a bit, but we get to distributed memory supercomputing. This is when you actually have memory over here and memory over here, and you're breaking things up amongst machines, and you have to hook things together with the network. This means you have to learn parallel processing, MPI, right? That could give some of you nightmares, those three letters. Um, it really is challenging to have to shuttle data around because you have to break, divide the, pro the process amongst many machines. Well, it just keeps getting worse. Now we've got supercomputers, multiple thousands of, or hundreds of cores, but they bolt GPUs onto them that are bizarre things that are gonna take over the world if we're not careful. Um, but we can also exploit them. So now you have several layers of parallel, uh, you know, fine granularity parallelism. And it's a real challenge. So I mention this because, as I say, I spend a lot of my time worrying about computers, not weather, which is really much more fun if you really get down to it. But it's also very satisfying, and I know that somebody needs to do this. We need to, we need to be using the, 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 the processing that's available to us so that we can answer questions that can't be answered otherwise. And that's really where my perspective comes from. So it takes a lot of time to get to know these new machines and port code and get stuff going. I'm currently uh, on the Blue Water supercomputer. And now that I've been on the machine for like seven years, I'm just about getting used to it. And then they're going to shut it down because that's the way supercomputers go. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. It really is. I really started working on this problem with tornadoes in 2010 or so when I took my sabbatical. Uh, I was at Central Michigan University. CMU represent. All right. All right. Woo. Fire up chips. All right. Uh, I developed a process. I did a lot of things while I was on my sabbatical, but I, one of the things that sort of the best outcome, which was completely unexpected, was I developed a file system, essentially. I was told that's what I did. I didn't call it that. I had talked to a computer science person. The way that I store data, I still spread it out amongst files. I won't go into it in detail. I use compression, and it works pretty well. I can actually, you'll see some of my animations. I've saved every model time step in the animation, so there's nothing missing. One-sixth of a second, saving data at that interval. Um, I threw a lot of soundings at the wall. We were running out of our allocation. Lou Wicker from NSSL saved me. He gave me the 24 May 2011 sounding that we all know now produces an EF5 tornado. It was from an event that produced the real EF5 tornado. And we continue to explore this storm and work that is being uh, spearheaded by Kathy Finley at University of North Dakota. We've got another storm. Um, it's actually, we took a Rahab, she took a Rahab, and, and found that it was producing tornadoes at like 250 meters. And we're like, okay, that's cool. And we ran it at 30, and it produced a pretty good tornado as well. So you can actually take a Rayab, plug it into CM1, and get a tornado. That's pretty cool. Go to the University of Wyoming site and grab it. 
Um, so when I do simulations, like the coarsest I really feel comfortable running for my science runs is 30 meters isotropic. So that's a nice cube mesh, no, 30 meters on each side. Um, tornadoes are re reasonably resolved in this grid spacing. You're not quite getting the subvortices resolved, but you know you got to stop somewhere. Uh, we've had sex success down to 15 meters, uh, which is about 20 billion grid zones. It starts getting a little hairy at those sizes. I'm, I'm currently, I've got 20 million node hours on the last nine months of blue waters to do um, 10 meters. And you might ask yourself, well, what are you getting from all this? Well, this is the kind of simulation you can only do on a machine like this. And it's, you know, we sometimes call them hero simulations and they're just done and you just go clap and everyone forgets about it. But I'm saving all the data from this and we're going to do some science with it. And we're going to share a lot of our data as well uh, once I get all my stuff together. So uh, the real storm that I'm going to show you next um, produced it at long track EF5 as did our simulations. I discovered very early on in this process, and this is one of those things, a story I'll tell you. So when I got the sounding from Lou Wicker, it went up to 16 kilometers. And I was like, I got to get this supercell some room to breathe. I'm going to extend the atmosphere up to 20 kilometers. But I did it in a really brain dead way. I just guessed what, th what theta should be at the Z levels. I, you know, I've done this enough. Oh, I don't need to do this. So I got my simulation. It produced this lovely tornado. I discovered the error in the sounding. You never look above 100 millibars. Who looks above 100 millibars? Well, I looked above 100 millibars, and I realized that I was getting a more of a tropospheric a profile where I had thrown my theta values in very haphazardly. So, all right, I fixed it, reran it. I got an anticyclonic EF4. <laughs> what the? There's been one anticyclonic EF4 ever measured, I think, and it was outside in 1980 in Brookfield, Wisconsin, maybe? And the EF4 damage is about the size of that table. So EF, anticyclonic EF4s aren't common. I just had my lovely cyclonic EF5 that I was kind of getting familiar with, and you give me this thing? So I'm like, I'm just going to quit. This is awful. Um, it, no, it literally almost did me in. I mean, I, I had it, and then I lost it. So what I, what I, ended, I got it back, obviously. but. I fixed the sounding. I went back to the exact moves that I made. Because when I ran the first simulation, I had to de decrease the time step because it blew up. I had to do these little things. When I repeated those steps, the tornado came back. Now, since then, I've redone this simulation. But look, sensitivity is a real issue. But I'm hoping to sort of turn it around on itself and say that when we're going to do uh, we're going to do ensembles of, of everything that we possibly can so that we don't just have one simulation to look at. When it comes to learning about how supercells work, I think determinism, deterministic simulations are great. You can look at a single storm, you can do all your budget analysis and stuff. But it, when it comes to forecasting, I really feel like you should never, ever even look at a deterministic forecast. You should look at the ensembles. And forget about the deterministic forecast. Look at the envelope, the spread. Look at that. That's where everything is when it comes to forecasting. You might get lucky once in a while with a nice high-res uh, deterministic simulation, but there's nothing like a good ensemble. And I need to learn how to do these right, but you're going to start seeing ensembles at 50 meters, 30 meters in, in supercell work. I hope to do that. The second storm, as I said before, that we've, be we've had some success simulating is this one, uh, the 18Z uh, Rayab as input. Now, I'm going, I'm already half hour and I haven't shown you any cool stuff yet, so I got to get moving. Um, so I'm gonna, here's the cool part. Here's the cool part starting. So I, I like to compare. Uh, model data to uh, observations. So let's get ourselves sort of familiarized with what's going on here. Here's a wonderful picture taken by, um, oh gosh, his name's, I thought I gave him credit. Uh, Marshall, Tim Marshall, uh, I think. No, you said Roger Hill. Roger Hill, thank you. Thank you very much. Is it up there? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I do this stuff with the video. Sometimes things get lost. So here's, here's the things we know about rear flank. Forward flank, meso, tornado, tail cloud. This is a nice picture of Bruce Lee uh, I, I brought to my attention. It shows all the things, including this, this tail cloud thing that, that we think might uh, be a hint of something more important. Uh, this is my simulation. Um, I'm kind of red, green, colorblind, so things often look weird. So it's floating in green jello, I guess. But I try to make it look like you know blue sky, green ground. Well, that's what you get. Um, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I need to have someone to consult with on this. So anyway, but the, you know, it pretty much, no, I'm, I blocked out the rain, so you're only seeing uh, the cloud. But OK, it comes out pretty good. Here's a loop. Again, I don't have attributes. This is something I got from YouTube, and I, I don't remember who did it. I just doing, I'm just repeating the loop. I just took like a two-second segment, because it shows what's going on. Forward flank, rear flank, tail cloud, meso. You know, get into that. That's, that's what we're looking at here. That's, that's the perspective we're looking at. So here's our 30-meter control simulation. Uh, cloud, rain. 
I'm painting the ground with uh, theta rho prime, which is a nice proxy for, say, buoyancy. So negatively buoyant is blue. And I've saturated the color map a bit. There's actually more variation in there than it looks like. But I wanted to make, make it visible in the back of the room. Um, so you'll see you know, this goes on. It, this is one second data. You can see these little tags that suggest rotation, perhaps. This is indeed the location of what I call a parade of vortices coming down the line. Tornadogenesis occurs. It actually occurred before you saw that, as it shouldn't surprise you. Um, a condensation funnel on the ground is not the indicator of a tornado on the ground, right? Because you, know, you can have tornadoes on the ground without a condensation funnel. And indeed, there's a tornado present before that funnel shows, and I'll go into that some more. Um, you know, there's some interesting, I will say that in the rear flank of the storm, you see some interesting things. You see these blasting downdrafts of rain that are actually warm. You, that when you see the surface turn red, that is a positive pressure, temperature perturbation. So you see these positively buoyant downdrafts. So I have to think they're being adiabatically compressed, right? I mean, you've got to be, something's got to be forcing that air to get warmer than the surrounding air and it's coming from above. Um, but I don't think it's actually in, uh, helping or, or hindering the tornado very much. Um, so anyway, it goes on and on. It's a fat wedge now. Uh, it's a bit, it gets sort of ensconced by rain here. So when you have a, 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 a you know, rain-wrapped tornado, as they call it, that's a dangerous situation and you don't want to be in that mess, but there's a tornado in there, right? Um, so the simulation looks pretty good. Uh, this is prior to tornado genesis. Now let me explain what you're looking at. You're now looking at vorticity, the three-dimensional vorticity magnitude, okay? But I'm shading it by the vertical component of vorticity only. This allows me to show all the vortices, but when you see big red stuff, cyclonic, when you see blue stuff, anticyclonic. Um, and the horizontal vortices will still show up like on the ground, but they're gray because they're horizontal, right? So I've made the colors uh, that way. So this is the core of the mesocyclone. It's what eventually morphs into what I'm calling the streamwise vorticity current. This is a feature that I first jumped out at me when I started looking at this, this, these crazy results. I saw this thing that was being slurped into the updraft way off on the other side of the storm. And it's like, it's a persistent thing. It just keeps going and going. It's probably important. I should probably study it. Um, and that's where, what we're doing. Um, it's associated with, as you'll see, a very significant pressure drop. I'm speeding things up for the sake of time. Different perspective, you can see it's along the forward flank. The vorticity is, 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 is being lifted by the updraft, but it's also strengthening the updraft, we think. Uh, it's certainly correlated with a very, very strong pressure drop, which leads to a very strong vertical pressure gradient, which leads to a very strong low-level updraft. So um, it just locks itself in, you know, it's just churning through here, winds on the ground, easily 300 miles an hour. I mean, instantaneous, so I wouldn't take that too, too you know, with a, with a grain of salt. When you look at, models will give you the instantaneous data, so you always get big maxes and mids. Uh, I dropped a whole bunch of parcels along the forward flank and let them go and watch this. This is why I decided I was gonna call this the streamwise vorticity stream. Well, I can't call it that. And Bruce Lee was the one who came up with current. I think that's a good one. SVC, streamwise vorticity current. It's a streamwise vorticity something. Uh, and it's, again, the streamwise vorticity, the, the, the vector, the, the wind vector and the vorticity vector are oriented in the same direction. So helical flow, right? Perfect helical flow. Uh, much of the vorticity in the SVC is streamwise. Um, remember, the rest of it has to be crosswise if we're gonna do that compartmental, compartmentalization. Um, okay, so here's where I'm going to show you every model time step during tornado genesis. So you're not missing anything. Um, we're looking at this from a funny perspective, sort of from, uh, we're looking towards the north, right? So the SVC is going to be coming up and around this side. This is where you're going to be paying attention or so, but this is the cold pool. And one thing that blows my mind, and it still blows my mind, is look at these vortices, all right? This horizontal vortex here at eight kilometers is a vertical vortex at seven kilometers. Over the course of a kilometer, a vortex has been tilted into the vertical. Now I've been told most of my meteorological career that you, know, you can't get vertical vorticity to do anything because there's none on the ground, right? You can't stretch that which does not exist, etc. This updraft says, hold my beer. Um, <laughs> It is strong enough. I don't think we realize how strong the updrafts are near the ground. And if there's anything that I would like to sort of put out there to the observationalists and the folks who go out in the field, 
is there a way we can measure the updraft directly? I, I really enjoyed the talk on, on the um, rainfall and pointing a radar up, because I'm like, yes, we need to point our radars up. Now, I, again, am not a, uh, a radar guy, and I know that there's a problem. Maybe LIDAR would be more useful, but we need to measure the updraft directly and stop messing around with downdrafts and implying all this other stuff. So let's let this go. Um, but let it be known or let it be shown that, yes, updrafts can tilt horizontal vorticity into the vertical over a very short distance and stretch the crap out of it and do its thing. So um, when I look at these simulations, it's all about the updraft. It's all about the updraft, the structure of the updraft and what's going on. Um, I'm shading the vorticity magnitude by the updraft speed. So this dark green, and again, apologize for the color scheme. It sucks being colorblind. You do what works. Eventually, it gets so strong, all the, you see vorticity kind of converging and just melding into this one vortex that becomes a tornado. So vor tornado genesis in my simulations, and in the way I've looked, I've looked at two, mostly just this one storm, keep that in mind, is a gradual sort of storm-wide process that results in a vortex eventually becoming a tornado, but it almost is irrelevant or doesn't matter which one it was. There's plenty of it out there. There's all sorts of vorticity in supercells, especially along the boundaries. Everything is spinning. You can't see it. It might kick up some dust in the real atmosphere. This is the SVC, by the way. This is the thing that I was like, this has to be important. Now look at as the pressure drops in the meso. Look at the convergence. I mean, it's like everybody coming together. Um, you know, does it really matter? Should we be looking at this vortex, that vortex? No, who cares about the individual ones? It's the process that is leading to this convergence of vorticity that ends up resulting in a tornado. So when I look at Genesis, I look at it in a, it's a steady process that involves uh, some, and again, I can only speculate because we, I have grad students working on this. We haven't quantified it yet. But the SVC, here's one more view of this from the, from the view that you might be if you're chasing, um, showing this, showing the cloud field, just a piece of it, so you can see, you, know, you can sort of see where the vorticity and the little cloud dimples are. Um, but there it is. Once you get this wrap around, once these vortices sort of stop going into the rear flank and then just, oh, we're going to come back, I think the pressure's just dropped enough. The pressure gradient force is doing it, and everything just reaches this sort of tipping point where it just converges. It all converges or accumulates in one spot, forming a tornado. Okay, so uh, I've been in, uh, Jana Hauser and I have been talking a little bit. I know she comes to this conference. I wish she was here. I know she's not this one time. But she has some pretty interesting data from the 31 May 13 storm that we all know way too much about for some reasons that are really sad. Um, she has evidence of a funnel cloud on the ground earlier than what was previously reported. But when you scan above that tornado, because they've got, they've got actual uh, racks pole data, you don't see any couplet. <laughs> it's like there's a tornado on the ground and it's attached to nothing. So she's pushing a top, a, a bottom up theory of tornado genesis. And I'm like, you know, that's pretty interesting. You know, so uh, this, is an, this is something that I have no, uh, I'm just like, I don't know either. Okay, I'm just trying to figure this stuff out. So what I did was I went back to our simulation I've been showing you, just to, just to do this, I'd never done this before. I'm like, Jana, I'm gonna show you what tornado genesis looks like in our simulation. So all I'm doing here is taking the vorticity magnitude, 0 0.5, it's a pretty high a value, but at 30 meters, it's not. So there's a vorticity you're not seeing, but I just wanna demonstrate a point here. Is tornadoes, and I'm, I'm gonna shade this by the storm relative horizontal wind. So where you see it's black, it's really transparent. It means the winds here are too weak to even register. It's not a tornado. When you start seeing going into the whites and the reds, it's a tornado strength winds. So I'll let this go once, and then I'll run it again and we'll talk about it. Okay, it's a tornado now. Let's do this again slower. So it starts out with the vortex. That is not a tornado. It's still not a tornado. It's still not a tornado. At least if, the way I define a tornado. It's not a tornado. It's not a tornado. It's not a, we have tornado strength winds aloft. It's not a tornado. It's not a tornado. It's not a tornado. It's a tornado on the ground. All right. I'm being a little bit silly. Is tornado genesis a top down or bottom up process? Yes. <laughs> All right, so, all right, in all seriousness, and again, this is pure speculation because I've not done the real work. And again, I, I really hesitate to use this analogy, but I gotta use it anyway. It kind of reminds me of, as an analogy only, a dart leader for a lightning stroke, lightning strike. You set up, set up that vortex, and then, pooh, 
there's some communication between where the maximum amount of kinetic energy is in the ground. And it's somehow that, that seems to be, that's kind of what I'm going with. Um, but again, this is pure speculation. But is it up, up down, down, up? It's, it's what is going up and what is going down? Tell me what, you know, when you ask that question, you have to ask it very clearly. But when I, what I see is a little of both. But there's like this anchor vortex, I don't know what, what else to call it at this point, that forms and that once you get that communication network and everything's lined up right, okay, tornado be coming. Um, this is the same simulation with the same process, vorticity magnitude shaded by the vertical components. So here's a cyclonic guy, anticyclonic, cyclonic, anticyclonic, horizontal primarily, prior to tire tornado genesis. What I'd like you to focus on is watch the parade of these vortices as they move towards the rear flank from the forward flank. Early on, these guys have no problem just kind of cruising along, hanging out at the rear flank of the storm, do 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 do, hanging out at the rear flank. Yeah, we'll just go here. But now, what? All of a sudden, you'll see so they slow down, and then you see this kind of wrap around, and it's like tornado time, baby. Really, that's it. All notice they're not coming the other way. So when I see things doing like that, I'm like, there's got to be a pressure gradient force at play here. Something's got to be changing. Because everything was going this way before, now it's coming back. I mean, maybe I'm crazy, but I think the pressure gradient force may be playing a role in this. Um, so I'm speeding it up. But again, once it's established, you get all sorts of cool stuff. You get vortex shedding. You get little vortices that get uh, horizontal vortices that get lifted around the tornado's periphery. You get anticyclonic vortices fighting with the cyclonic vortices and getting twisted and turned. All sorts of really neat stuff when you get down to the detail, detail of it. Now you see the... the um, the tornado has entered a two-celled mode where it has a downdraft. You see the uh, intertwined vortices aloft. It looks really good. I mean, it looks like the chamber models. It looks like um, the things that we would come to expect from very highly resolved chamber simulations, only we're now getting closer to that resolution with a full a barotropic, a baroclinic, you know, a full supercell, not a barotropic um, chamber, which I think is good for some things, but, but really is not good for others. Um, during tornado, this is every one second or every one sixth of a second. There she goes, twirling around, looks like a little barber's pole. Here's those horizontal vortices being tilted and drawn in. I mean, it's just beautiful, right? It's, it's on the ground, it's, 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 it's turning and it's being turned. It's like rotation everywhere. Um, but off she goes to the races, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. I, I guess I just say that up at the top because I think we need to realize that strong updrafts can do things that we don't expect they can do. They don't require downdrafts right in the vicinity to kick things off. There's downdrafts all over the place in supercells doing things that downdrafts have to do, but I don't think you really need one to form a tornado, at least not in the vicinity. That's my, this research has got me to rethink some of the conceptual models out there, but uh, I'll just show you. I mean, I can show this, one of the reasons I, I put time into this type of video is it helps me understand what's going on, but it also conveys things better than I can, can write or talk about, even though I do stand here and talk about it a lot. Um, here's a 15 meter simulation. We actually start out with an anti-cyclonic tornado. This is again the same damn sounding. You get a different result, but you do get a similar result, but it's the details are quite different. So we have an anti-cyclonic tornado that uh, decays and one cyclonic tornado comes about. That's kind of interesting, sort of like a seesaw thing going on here. Notice the tail cloud is now much more cellular convective. That's kind of what you'd expect with more resolution, although some real tail clouds are quite laminar looking. Um, this is a really cool simulation. It's just you know, chock full of all sorts of vortex action, you know, tiny vortices being ripped around. Uh, you can't see a lot of it because I'm only showing the cloud field. Uh, but look at this boundary here out in the what flank the hell is that, right? The something flank. See, we need more flanks or we need to just come up with a different way of describing where we are in the storm. But that boundary is, is incredible. Um, what's it doing there, <laughs> right? It was over there, now it's over here. So the cold pool is a very dynamic place. It's chock full of vorticity, chock full of all sorts of stuff. Uh, oh yeah, here's an anticyclonic tornado and they're gonna dance a little bit. I don't know why these things happen. I just run the model, right? Uh, <laughs> <coughs> well, you know, so, but anyway, it's, again, I show this because I think, I like to at least convince people that I'm not completely nuts. I think what I'm seeing here is, re you know, the things I'm saying are way out in the stratosphere because I can just show them. So watch Tornado Genesis, here's Tornado Genesis. So if you can figure that out, you can win a Nobel Prize or something, I don't know. But, you know, what, you know what's going on there? You'll see that now things, here's, a, here's the anti, the blue guy, going away. That's where that first condensation funnel was. And then, you, then things just kind of take a slight turn. 
haha, <laughs> oh sorry. And there's our cyclonic tornado. So, wow, <laughs> that is freaky. <laughs> What's going on? Obviously, we have a lot of analysis to do. Um, and, you know, I sort of give myself grief for not publishing more on this work, but the truth is, I have a, such a store of data that I'll be, to be able to use for a long time. I want to get it right when I do it. Um, now you can really see the SVC, that horizontal vortex. Even though this is a bundle of, of, of phosphorescent spaghetti, it's still doing the streamwise thing. It's, it's, you, know, it's, you can see that it's, uh, it's definitely uh, contributing to the storm. OK, um, all right, I want to see where I am here on time. Good. Here is some temporally average data. This is kind of the, the analysis I think I had to figure out how to get rid of all the beautiful stuff in the simulation and just smooth the crap of it, smooth the crap out of it. So I did it in time. So what you're looking here, every single frame you see here is actually 120 times average, centered average. So if, it's, if, if the time is 3185, I've gone back 60 seconds all the way to 60 seconds past centered on that and averaged everything together. I wrote a Python script to do it. Um, it took a little while, but everything works out. So now you're seeing temporally averaged fields. The reason I can get away with this is I've managed to get the box speed of this storm pretty well so that it looks like it's just sitting in place. Okay, pressure perturbation field. What's going on? You start to see this spreading region of, of low pressure. At the same time, you're going to start to see the updraft start to descend and also get stronger. Um, so we're going a few more seconds. We start to see these new isosurfaces surfaces forming. Um, now we've got this thing that looks like a banana sitting up here at, you know, 20, milli 20 millibar pressure drop, also very much correlated with what's going on in the updraft. And watch as it grows more. Again, temporally average data. This isn't instantaneous. You've got 30, 40, 50 millibar pressure drops for long periods of time. The tornado forms, don't pay attention to the morphological characteristics of that, a bit descending or whatever, because it's a temporally averaged field, but that's tornado genesis in a sort of in a really high-end supercell notice the pressure field here this little thing here that's right associated with the SVC the streamwise vorticity current so I'll get this going more and it just goes even more crazy eventually you know that that this pressure low this lowering in the pressure field is certainly associated with we love that term in meteorology because it keeps us from having to actually explain causality, but it's certainly associated with this. I hate that word sometimes, and I love it at the same time, because I can sort of, anyway, so look at the pressure drop here. I mean, just look at that stuff. So this little tube, this little piece of the SVC, if we're gonna call it that, is, you know, 50 to 25 HPA at least. Um, so it's, it's, these temporally averaged fields give you sort of my own conceptual model of what's going on. Because you can sort of treat this as like a steady, st this is like a steady state-ish part of the solution that, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. But you can tell we're doing a pretty good job. You can still see the tornado when we average it over 120 uh, seconds. So, but anyway, so my, the theory that we're sort of coming to, or it's sort of hard to, it's hard to not notice these things. So the SVC, and we have to get the mechanism for why it's causing the pressure drop. I mean, I kind of know why, what it has to be, one of two or three things, because we understand how pressure works. But we need to do our due diligence. We haven't done it yet. But the SVC is causing that. I'm, I'm certainly, certainly sure of that. Well, I have to prove it. But, but look at this and that. And so do, we have updrafts like you know, 500 meters above the ground that are 60 meters per second, 50 meters per second. I mean, I made a joke at the talk uh, in, in, uh, in Ames where if you just throw your hat in the air, you may never see it again under an updraft. It's just going to go away. It's end up in Kansas. So, so, yeah, I mean, this tells a pretty compelling story. I haven't said much about that or the, the letter that comes after it very much. I don't need to. It's not a part of the story. I'm sorry, but it's just not. Not yet or not, not obviously. Updraft, you know, the tornado updraft, of course, is hugely strong, but here's the same view with the streamwise vorticity on this side, so the uh, volume rendering this time, so the pressure on the left is big egg that expands out, the updraft sinking to the ground, streamwise vorticity going crazy over here on the right. So um, this right here is about as good as I can explain this simulation. What you see here, I've taken away all the cool stuff, focused on the sort of the average stuff, and that's what it looks like. So it's pretty cool. I, I think we're onto something that has, it's gonna probably change the way that we look at certain types of supercells. And I gotta be careful with my language because I've been spending a lot of time on one storm. 
I've only started to look at another storm a little bit, and Kathy Finley is, is the one who's really a lead of that project, so I'm not gonna come to any grindy house conclusions, but I'll show a lot of video and let people think about it. Uh, streamwise vorticity now shaded by the st storm relative wind speed, so you've got streamwise vorticity getting more crazy. As it gets darker and darker, it means that you have the velocities increasing, so you're looking at horizontal stretching in real time. You're obviously horizontally stretching this vorticity because it's getting faster along its path. So it's being stretched horizontally. So horizontal stretching of horizontal vorticity is just as important as vertical stretching of vertical vorticity in the simulation. The updraft doesn't care. It's just slurping everything up from all, all directions. Well, not all directions, but it's, it's really just a giant uh, vacuum cleaner. I don't know what else to call it. It's really amazing. So I wanted to look at some cross sections of wind vectors. So I'm taking this perspective right here. So there is the rear flank, forward flank. There's the tornado. So I'm putting this plane. This is, again, the, the temporally average data to sort of watch this process. And it's hard to see the arrows maybe in the back of the room. Uh, we're in the forward flank here. Rear flank is way back there. This is our, our, our forward flank downdraft boundary. Um, you'll notice that, OK, the tornado form. But what, what I wanted, what shows up to me the most is that You'll notice these vectors get longer and darker in color as time goes on. I'll show it again. Um, what it really tells me is that there's this, this, this meso-wide process that's causing this huge widespread increase in updraft. So watch these arrows get longer and bluer. This is up a little bit higher. See how they go? All right, this is temporally average data. So this is definitely a strong signal, really strong signal. It's a persistent signal. And then a tornado forms. And it actually formed before that because, you know, I'm averaging. So again, here's right in the ground level. Look at those vectors. They're getting longer. They're getting longer. The pressure's increasing. Pressure gradient's increasing. It's not as clear, maybe, but you know, again, I say pressure because you know, when you have a 50 millibar pressure drop that height, it's got to be doing something. OK, so this is something I just discovered like yesterday. Um, one of my grad students, uh, Austin Dixon, is, is looking at our data and trying to see what would an SVC look like on radar. By, he created a radar emulator, and he can sweep data through our 3D data. Um, why am I mentioning that? Um, Alex Sheath at Texas Tech, another grad student, uh, saw a cool radar image of what looks like to be what might be an SVC from this tornado. So this is the, this is the I guess we'll call it the Lovelaceville, Kentucky storm of March 14th, 2019. This is near the Paducah radar. Some of you are probably familiar with this storm. I don't think Paducah was amused by this storm. But let me just, this is just some dude's video, but I want you to look, it's a nice tornado. It's got your sub vortices. It's got horizontal vortices. I've taken the sound out just to be nice. There's a beautiful horizontal vortex. I love those. Um, but it, you know, it's okay. It's a, it's a pretty good tornado. It's, I don't know if it's an EF3, EF4, I'm not sure. But it happened. Okay, on the right is the Paducah radar from that storm. And I'm sorry I don't have my, uh, I didn't label my colors and it wouldn't matter because I can't see them right anyway, but let's just say that this green thing here, this green thing here is going away from the radar. So it Im implies that there is a storm relative jet coming to where the tornado tip is, which is right about there. Um, Austin, I said, hey, put your radar where Paducah's radar is in our storm, just sort of put it the same perspective. And he gets a very similar signal. Um, now, I'm not saying we have found the radar signature of the SBC, no. But there is definitely a similarity. And when you're really close to the radar like that, you can see close to the ground. So this is kind of cool, you know, because again, I've been to model land, model land, you know, it's good to see something in real world that is actually somewhat validating your, your life, <laughs> your research. So, okay, so research, not life. Um, I got everything's going on. This is the uh, storm that Kathy's working on. So this is the, um, the, the southeastern outbreak storm. We're just calling it amongst ourselves Tuscaloosa, just for simplicity. I'm not claiming to simulate the actual Tuscaloosa storm. Um, but here early on, before the tornado forms, you know, I've, I've clipped it a bit so it looks a bit weird. But forward flank, nice little tail cloud. You got your nice rain behind here, and the, for, and the rear flank is over here. So I'll just let this run. Uh, I haven't done a lot with this. Uh, because this is Kathy's storm pretty much. But also we have an issue with the microphysics where rain gets inside the tornado and it's sort of, um, we need to centrifuge it out of there and we're working on that problem. But one of the results of this is that the, the rain scours away the cloud. <laughs> I think that's what's happening. So there's actually a tornado on the ground, you just don't see it. It's not as impressive as the 24 main one, but it's a beautiful storm in the vorticity field as we sort of approach the last sort of quarter of a talk. Um, over here in the forward flank, <laughs> what's going on there? The gyre from hell. I mean, it's really cool, but I don't know what's going on. Here's, here's our, where we would see our SVC, assuming it is. I'm using a low threshold, but what's what great about this storm is it's 
turning vorticity from the boundary layer ahead of the storm, you get these vortex sheets that form and then they wrap up. So this, this is really cool because I think this is more messy, like the real atmosphere, even though it's because our boundary layer has Richardson numbers between 0 and 0.25. So there's some overturning-ish stuff going on. Uh, but it's a beautiful storm. Uh, tor tornado genesis happens in there somewhere. Uh, you'll, I, it's hard to see the way I've done it. I'll show some lower threshold stuff or higher threshold stuff in a moment. But isn't it beautiful? Look at the, what's going on in the forward flank. It's like just all sorts of cascading downdrafts and vorticity going all over the place. Um, it's really something, really something else. Um, so here, okay, so here is, and I haven't gone back far enough in time, and I'm not just cutting off the rear flank because I don't like it. It's just, it's just the way this one came out. This is tornado genesis, so we're looking at the reflectivity field. And you can see there's already a few scattered cyclonic vortices, but here is tornado genesis in this storm. And maybe you can figure out what's going on. No tornado, no tornado, no tornado, eh, ta tornado. So definitely some consolidation convergence going on, right? You had this disparate sort of spread out region of vorticity that just basically coalesced into this beautiful vortex. And it's interesting that once that happens, you don't see those other ones anymore. I don't know. Is there only so much vorticity to go around? I don't know. But anyway, that's, for, that's Genesis. Here's a view of the updraft ISIS surface on the right, vorticity. And I've got blue as downdrafts because we've got to look at what the downdrafts are doing. Uh, yeah, there's some stuff going on over there. Here's the, the view from above. But, you know, that vortex is just, there's your reflectivity. It's this beautiful, thin uh, hook echo that looks more realistic, I think, than, it looks very realistic. I think it looks really good. Um, this is a, not as much of a top end, you know, tear the ground, you know, a foot, foot of soil out of the ground tornado, which is good because we want some tornado diversity. I don't want to just study top end EFIs my whole life, but we should at least figure those out. Um, you know, this one takes a little more time to sort of get its, get its thing going really well. You'll see it gets stronger, the updraft, uh, you'll see some, I think this is when it's transitioning over to a two-celled. You see it gets kind of all messed up. Then the downdraft starts to, the updraft really starts to start ripping. And this thing gets stronger. You start to see the two-celled thing going on. Da -da 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 -da. And then eventually it exits stage left, um, or stage right, sorry. Stage right, that's right. I used to do that thing. Okay, so <laughs> it goes away. I, again, I got to end this talk at some point. Um, so, okay, so what I've done thus far is I've given you sort of a really quick, uh, the best I can do summary of where we are on both of these storms, okay? Um, I do have some more stuff if you're willing to sit around. Um, I like to, I'm doing some collaborative work with a, a, a storm videographer slash chaser. His name is um, Hank Shima. He, you might know him as Pecos Hank on YouTube. Really cool guy. Um, I look forward to the kind of stuff we're going to do down the road. But he has looked at my stuff and he has this like, encyclopedic memory for storms and he can pick out stuff that he's seen before. So here's a little thing we put together where we compare model data, this is a model, the modeled storm, our modeled storm, um, to actual footage. Just to say, wow, I think we're on the right track here. Those two things look pretty similar, all right? That's good. Uh, that's our 30 meter simulation. Here's some Amatis clouds. I did a little color shading, I'll admit on the left, but that's pretty good. I mean, you'd be forgiven to think the left is real um, and the right is a model because they look very similar. Uh, here's our tail cloud. Here's a shot that Hank found showing a very nice tail cloud in a storm that I don't believe is tornadic, but that's okay. Um, here's our SVC going on. He, this one really excites me when I see that because that really sort of indicates, you can see the horizontal vorticity coming around. It looks very similar to what we see in the model. So that was a non-tornadic storm. Here he plays with some of the, just kind of blending things in. Uh, I, don't ask me which storms these are. I have a terrible memory for this sort of thing. I can't tell you, but uh, he can. <laughs> and here is, uh, I used to put this one side by side, the Rochelle tornado. Uh, that, that footage, that poor guy who had in the side of I-39 I, uh, took. But um, anyway, look, beautiful multiple vortices. And here's some horizontal vortices that Hank found. And, and you can see similar things going on on the left there. So, you know, we do this because, again, I have to make sure I'm not just in la-la land here. I mean, I got to make sure I'm paying attention to the real atmosphere. I and mean, when you spend most of your time debugging code, you know, you got, you got to have someone to, to take you out of that. So some parting thoughts, um, and then I'll sort of get to some opinions that I have about all this stuff. But, you know, technology clearly has played a role in a zillion things in life. Right? I don't have to explain that. Um, it certainly has had influences on weather forecasting and our understanding of the atmosphere. Uh, we are currently in the throes of a GPU revolution, graphical processor unit as opposed to central processing unit. So in your, super, in your computer, if you have a PC or a desktop, 
They don't even call them PCs anymore. But, um, your graphics card, right? Your graphics card has graphical processing units, GPU. They can be used, they do certain calculations very quickly. Um, they're being used as essential engines for doing compute now. And I'm really stoked on this. You can build a computer in, your, in this room on that desk that is more powerful than any existing computer of the 20, 20th century, unless the NSA did it. I don't know. Maybe they had a better one. But no, I looked this up. You can get more flops today from a GPU machine, a pretty good one. It's going to cost you 100K or so. That'll beat any supercomputer of the 20th century. So the, this is really changing a lot of stuff. It takes a lot of time to learn how to use this technology. So that's why I'm a little bit crazy, because I spend so much time, OK, I got to learn CUDA. I got to learn OpenACC. I got to learn C++. Blah. I got to adapt to this hardware. It's the only way we're going to be able to answer some of these questions, I think. So it's a challenge. It takes a long time. But I'm hoping to be doing things like you just saw here, 50 of those, and then analyzing them and doing some statistics to really answer questions about, you know, statistical questions about tornado genesis and maintenance and things like that. Um, so here's some of my opinions that are sort of the grumpy grandpa part of the talk. Because um, I'm kind of, I think our supercell conceptual model is out of date. Um, I really do. I try to use it in my own head when I look at stuff and it's like it's insufficient, it doesn't contain enough and it's misleading in at least some cases. Um, I haven't spoke much about RFDs, rear flank downdrafts. Um, they just don't show up as being important in these simulations. But I will say that they're sporadic and more likely than not, in, in this simulation, RFDs are more part of the effects of things going on in the mesocyclone, in the updraft, rather than the cause of a tornado. So both the RFD and the tornado are being essentially influenced by this stuff going on via the SVC, via the pressure drop. Um, that's what I think. Now, I haven't done, I've lost two NSF grants trying to do this, study the RFD, hasn't happened yet, but I think if we really focus our attention there, we're going to find out that, at least in these top end storms, it's just not a player. It's just not. What happens, well, let me finish my griping. Uh, I think it's a fool's errand to search for the elusive tornado trigger. If you think you're going to solve tornado genesis by looking at a two minute window, well, all right, maybe, you, maybe that top down stuff is cool and important, but what happened 20 minutes before then to set up the storm to do that, right? That's what I'm interested in. I think tornado genesis just happens under certain conditions. There's enough vorticity to stretch, you just got to get things lined up, lined up right. I think tornado genesis is truly a storm-wide process. It starts in the forward flank of the storm, from the rain and the, and the hail that forms that cold pool. Um, it ends, if you get things lined up right, and again, I don't, you know, this is all based on this stuff I'm showing you here. You can get a rapidly intensifying updraft that, you know, with this, with this amazing pressure drop, that followed by what I'm calling a vortex of opportunity it just happens to be it's in the right spot and the tornado forms. So it's a lot different than our current uh, our models of tornado genesis, and I could be wrong, of course, that's the way it is, but we shall see. So um, I do want to acknowledge a whole bunch of entities and people. First of all, the National Science Foundation for supporting the Blue Waters Project and the University of Illinois, and for supporting myself, and also the Space Science and Engineering Center, uh, and SIMS, my collaborators on this project and related projects, Catherine Finley at the University of North Dakota, Bruce Lee, Dr. Uh, Robert Wilhelmson, who is retired, enjoying his grandkids in Florida mostly, but he's also a guy who I really, really have learned a lot from, um, and I continue to today. Um, I'm also doing work with Larry Frank at UCSD, who has this method for looking at um, brain MRI scans, and we're trying to take that and apply it to Doppler radar. It's really freaky, but cool. Uh, Morgan O'Neill uh, is a new faculty at Stanford. She and I are going to look at above anvil cirrus plumes, and I actually have some footage of that, but I don't want to keep you guys too long, so I think I won't show it to you now. Is that all right? Oh, everyone's quiet. You want to see it? <laughs> I don't, I really, all right, it's, compl it's just sort of at the end. All right, I don't want to keep, if you want to leave, that's fine. All right. I feel better now, no one's leaving. All right, so Kelton Halbert, Austin Dixon, Michelle Elmore, who's in the audience, um, thank you all. I, I learned from all you guys as well. And I am gonna post this to the website um, I, that I put all my stuff on. Um, now, before we, we break, do you want me to show you some AACP stuff? So I'm, okay, so I had some more computer time and I'm interested in this other issue, not just tornadoes, but some of this stuff looks so cool, you really have to see it. So I'll show it to you. Um, okay, so I'll first show you the ice field. So. This is a reproduction of Homeyer et al.'s work. This is the top of the thunderstorm. 
This is the overshooting top. This is the ice field, and you'll see an out above anvil cirrus plume form in the ice field, although it doesn't show up as well. Look at that nice little slalom going on there. Whee! Um, now this is QV prime. So now we're looking at water vapor, and you'll see some beautiful entrainment, detrainment stuff going on here. Mushrooms pointing up, mushrooms pointing down. But there's your AACP. Boof! Look at that thing. It's got a mohawk. You know, thunderstorms have mohawks. It's the 80s all over again. Um, and there's some of that cool entrainment, detrainment. So this is water vapor mixing ratio. So you're seeing this is the really moist air at the top of the cloud. But, you know, the, look at that. That is cool. You know, detrainment, entrainment, detrainment, entrainment. Um, the reason we care about these things is they pump an awful lot of water in the stratosphere where it could actually destroy ozone, and that's a bad thing. Um, and they may be indicative. This is the same QI field, but shaded with W. So you're looking at, uh, you know, vertical velocities that are 30 meters per second, negative 30 meters per second. It's just all over the place, and there the AACP starts to form. We have issues with the microphysics. It doesn't really show the ice field as well as it might should. So I'm uh, talking to Paul Wang, who's a faculty at a AOS, who... Um, recently retired, but he, um, he has ideas about how to best look at the AACP. He's done working this. Now, here's kind of cool. I put the, oh, I don't have these tagged. I'm sorry. Um, here we have the water vapor perturbation field, and I put the cloud ice field right next to it, sliced it right down the middle so you can see both. So here we are again. We study these things because, A, they could be good indicators of severe weather, so we could use it perhaps as a now casting technique, but B, it can, it can destroy ozone, which is, you know, wow, that's a, that's a bad thing. And I don't know much about uh, ozone depletion in the stratosphere, but I do know a little bit about supercells. So maybe we can, you know, I'm gonna, this is the direction I'm going in some of my research, expanding out a little bit to understand what goes on on top of the supercell top. And this one should have techno music in the back of it because it's got the updrafts <laughs> on the side, you know? Um, so I, I put the W, painted the walls with W. This goes up to 30 kilometers, by the way, uh, or 27 kilometers. Uh, there is your AACP and there's W. So. Um, you see that there's gravity waves, gravity waves, all gravity waves. Um, but we're going to figure out, we're going to do some work with this. It's pretty cool. I thought I'd tack this on in case anyone was interested. Um, this is, again, this is a non-tornadic supercell. I used the strong shear case of Holmeyer et al. 2017, I think, um, who did a recent simulation uh, with Wharf. I took their sounding, which they were nice enough to publish as a, as a supplemental material, and I put it into CM1 and, and got that. I don't really get AACPs in my current storms that I'm studying, which is interesting. A really super strong storm, either that or it's just smattering the stratosphere with ice and water. I, I just don't see it. But anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. So this is another thing you can do with computers. This is 50 meter isotropic run up to 27 kilometers on blue waters. And you're only seeing part of the storm, right? There's a whole storm down there. I'm not showing you because I'm not looking at it. <laughs> but anyway, so all right, I guess I'm done. I better stop before I collapse. Um, no, I really appreciate the invite. I hope you've enjoyed some of this and found it to be educational and entertaining. Um, there's a switch on my back that I do this. I've, I've been told just kind of go off the rails. But uh, anyway, no, I, I appreciate any questions you might have, and I'd be happy to answer them. And I'm here for the whole conference, so I'll be leaving uh, Saturday at noon. So I'll be around if you want to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for a few questions, and if we don't get to everybody's questions, you know, yeah. deeply up on his offer since yeah. he's going to be around a while, and he's fascinating to talk to. So, anybody have a question or two they want to toss out? Uh, so, in this particular case, we had the non-chromatic supercell. Did you take a look down the you know updraft region and see those same signals of the convergence streamwise plasticity? Are you talking about this run right here? Yeah, this one. No, yeah, this one's, I just got this done like two weeks ago. All I managed to do is render it. So this, again, this, yeah, right, that's a good question. I might as well, while I'm there, because you can see where I'm kind of going with this. Maybe there's a link between something we can see with satellite. I work at a satellite place, after all, you know. And if we can use now casting techniques to see that means something down below, that would be awesome. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know. But at least I can get this thing to form in a really high resolution model. We can sort of pick it apart and see what's going on. But no, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked down there yet. Any other questions right now? Okay, if not. Yeah, I'm happy. Like I said, I'll be around. I'm happy to talk anytime you guys want. Just yeah, tap me on the shoulder. On it. Throw something at me. <laughs> so let's uh, thank Lee again. Thanks.